Welcome, everyone. I'm Susan Douglas. I'm chair of the Department of Communication Studies, and welcome to our annual uh, Marsh Lecture. Um, the Marsh Lecture and the professorship is made possible by the generosity of the Marsh family, which uh, supports our bringing eminent uh, uh, journalists from around the country and even around the world to come and teach to our students. Uh, it also supports this talk and a research fund for our faculty, and we are very grateful to the Marsh family for their ongoing support that brings the critical study of journalism uh, to our students. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our illustrious Marsh professor, James O'Shea. Um, Jim is a former editor of the Los Angeles Times and managing editor of the Chicago Tribune um, and is the author of three books, including The Deal from Hell, uh, which is a nonfiction narrative about the tragedy that sent the Tribune Company, owner of the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune, into the hands of real estate mogul Sam Zell and bankruptcy court. Um, this is one of the sadder stories in the annals of, uh, of journalism, and uh, Jim survived both of them. Um, when he was uh, editor of the LA Times in 2008, uh, the paper was one of uh, journalism's crown jewels, as many of you know. Then the industry and the Times imploded, uh, sending Jim on a journalistic odyssey through the choppy waters that roil the contemporary media. Uh, in his talk today, he's going to talk about his ensuing encounters with the challenges that face legacy media and digital upstarts. Please join me in welcoming Jim O'Shea. Well, thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? Okay. No? Hello. Test. Okay. Okay. I'm not used to standing in a lectern, so I'll be intimidated here. Um, thanks, Susan, for that nice introduction. And thanks, Susan, and the communications department and the Marsh family for this great opportunity to come here and teach at a just marvelous university. Uh, I hope my students, many of whom are here, uh, got as much out of my presence here as I got out of them. I learned an awful lot from my students and uh, really enjoyed the teaching experience. Um, I, I'm, I know this was billed as a lecture, and uh, I'm sitting here looking at a group of people who deliver lectures for a living. And so I think instead of doing that, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I'm going to do what a journalist does, and I'm going to tell you a little story. And it is, it is an odyssey, an odyssey that uh, starts at the pinnacle of, uh, of, 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 of mainstream media and wanders through, you can call it wa waters, swamps, whatever you want, of the contemporary media and the new media that is now uh, is completely engulfing and uh, in reforming what we do. Um, my story really starts in 2008 when I was uh, editor at the LA Times. I was sitting on my porch uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Manhattan Beach, but it's quite a beautiful place. And I was sitting there staring out at the Pacific Ocean. It was one of those beautiful days, beautiful winter days that only you can only experience in Southern California. And uh, the, uh, as, I, as I was sitting in, in, in I, I was just pondering uh, what would come next because uh, I had, I, I, I had been the editor, had been sent there 16 months earlier by the Tribune Company, and, and what many people called Mission Impossible. My job was to see if I could calm down the newsroom of the LA Times, which was composed of 930 journalists who were furious with the corporate bureaucracy in Chicago, and they were in absolute open rebellion. And uh, so they asked me to go out there and see if I could calm things down and get people focused again on what we're supposed to be focused on, and that's journalism, and not how many people are going to get laid off the next week. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I began 
I, I really had a lot to thank the Tribune Company for, really. They sent me in a tough situation, but they had been very good to me. I mean, I was a kid from nowhere, and I got to run two of the best newspapers in America and the world. Uh, I had been a correspondent, and I roved the world on their dime, uh, interviewing, every, interviewing everybody from Muammar Gaddafi to uh, movie stars. I'd done uh, investigative reporting, so I really had a lot to, to help them for. And on this uh, particular uh, balmy winter day, they had just given me another opportunity, another great opportunity, one to spend more time with my family. I had been fired uh, by, the, by, the, by the Tribune brass because I refused to go along with the budgetary policies that I thought were detrimental to the newspaper, to the newsroom, to the journalists, to the readers, and to everybody else. And I had told them when they asked me to go out there, if all you want is somebody to cut the budget, don't send me, because I'm not going to do it. I didn't have anything wrong with any problem with cutting budgets. It's just, that what were you going to do with the savings? And that's where we got into a big argument. And so uh, I was sitting there watching the dolphins in the surf, trying to figure out what was going to come next. I started getting all these calls from my friends, congratulating me on my principled stand. Well, you know, a principled stand is a, is a stand where everybody says he's dumb enough to do it. We're not. But I, uh, I and, and, you know, they said, you, you, you need to write a book about this. And frankly, I, was a, I just didn't really want to, I didn't want to go there. I just wanted to put journalism behind me. I wanted to do something different, maybe something non-journalistic. Uh, we had been through a lot of budget wars, and it was a, it was a grueling job. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do something easy, like ride my bike from Belfast to Beirut. Now, that was one of my ideas. My wife didn't think that was a particularly good one. And so uh, I, uh, uh, and then, a, then a, a good friend of mine called me from Hollywood, and he says, you know, look, come on, you're sitting out on the beach, and you're, you haven't got anything to do. It's California, nice weather. Why don't you just write a book proposal? You don't have to write the book. Write the proposal. It'll make you feel better. So I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. He's got a point. Because it was January, and it was in, I was in California. And there was no way in hell I was going to go back to Chicago in January. And anybody that's just lived through this winter here knows what I mean. So uh, I started writing a book proposal. And frankly, it was pretty half-hearted. I really didn't have my heart into it. And then uh, the Tribune Company, again, came along and helped me out. Uh, they, uh, when I went to L.A., I had a, a contract. And uh, the, I still had 10 months to go on that contract. And they owed me 10 months of salary. And I was naive enough to think that after being with them almost 30 years, they'd pay me. But uh, that wasn't the way it was going to play out. So uh, I got a call, or no, I actually got an email from a, a lawyer in the HR department. They call it human relations. I call it human reduction. And uh, they said to me, OK, you know, if you, uh, uh, we're, we're going to give you your money. But you have to sign a non-disparagement agreement. And I don't know if you've ever dealt with non-disparagement agreements, but there are these long legalistic things that say, basically what it would say is that I, James O'Shea, would never say anything bad about the Tribune Company, its stockholders, its customers, its paper boys, everybody. And I, I said, you know, <laughs> I'm a journalist. I'm not going to sign that. And they said, OK, and well, then we aren't going to write a check. So we got into a little dispute about this, and it lasted for several weeks. Uh, they were basically, uh, they took the position that if I didn't sign it, they weren't going to give me a, a dime. And so I went, to my law, I went to a lawyer and I said, look, you know, and he said, oh, look, you go into court, you're going to win, hands down. But by the time you get done paying me, you will have spent all the money that, that you have coming to you. Now, I, I wasn't one of the people who got a, a golden parachute of millions of dollars. We're not talking about a lot of money here. I mean, if you were going to talk about my parachute, uh, it would have been tin rather than gold. It was not a lot of dough. But uh, I didn't ha I, I, it was something that I, I felt pretty strongly about. I wasn't going to sign this thing. And uh, we, we went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I came up with a solution. I, I, my lawyer said to me, you know, all the guy wants you to do is sign something. So sign, I don't think he cares too much about what's in it. 
I said, all right, well, then I'll write a paragraph that we'll insert into this agreement. And the paragraph said that there's nothing in this agreement that would prevent Mr. O'Shea from saying anything he wants about the experiences that he's had at the Tribune now, in the past, and in the future, forever. And so really, basically, it negated the whole agreement. And so I signed it. And he signed it. And then they said, okay, we're going to send you your check. Now, they didn't give me all the money that I was owed, but they gave me most of it. And I took the check. I went right to the bank. And I thought, I know where this company's heading. I'm going to deposit this check. And I did. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I ended up getting my money, and I ended up uh, 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 sitting down and writing this book proposal. And, and then I started thinking about it. I thought, you know, why are they so, what are they so worried about? What am I going to say that's going to make them feel so, you know, threatened? And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I should write this book. Maybe I should take a look at this book. If, if they're this afraid of it, maybe I know more than I think I do. So I picked up and I went back to Chicago. And I began doing research on, uh, on this book. And the more I looked at it, and the more I dug into it, the more I realized that even though I had been there, I had a front row seat to this disaster. I didn't really know what had gone on. I really didn't understand it all. I needed to do some more reporting. I needed to go in and start digging in and finding out who said what, when, where, and look at records and do all the things that a, a journalist do, does or an author would do when they would apply the discipline that, that a writer would apply to the subject. So I started digging into this, and uh, luckily, for, for my uh, perspective, uh, uh, I, was, I, was, I got a, a fellowship at the Shorenstein Center uh, for the Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. So this gave me an opportunity to do two things. One is to go do research on my book, and the second was to... Uh, was, was to uh, just sit back and, and, I, I, and think about things and think about my craft and think about what had happened and, and try to figure out where I was going with this. And it's a luxury that you do have in a university, in all universities, where you have time to think about things and you're in an intellectual atmosphere where you're exchanging ideas as opposed to running around a newsroom uh, with uh, constant uh, deadlines and a never-ending cycle of crises. So I went to Harvard and I decided I was going to really work on my book. And I wasn't going to write uh, the, the tell-all. I really wanted to go in and I was, this was going to be a reported book. Uh, and so I, I started, started digging into things and, uh, and inadvertently, by this time Mr. Zell was, was around, and uh, he, he, gave, he gave me my title. He uh, was commenting on his acquisition of the Tribune Company uh, newspapers. Yeah, I forgot to put the title up here. And uh, he, he described it as the deal from hell. So I thought, well, that would make a nice title. The subtitle was how moguls in Wall Street plundered great American newspapers. That made them all real happy. So uh, the, the book came out in 2011, but I was still working on it at Harvard. And I got a call. I got one of these calls, these fateful calls that really changed the way things happen for you. It was from Peter Osnos, who was the editor, the editor in chief of Globe, uh, Public Affairs Books, which was publishing the, which had bought the deal from Hell. And I thought, okay, he's going to call and start hounding me already about where are your initial chapters. And I got on the phone, and I was totally wrong. Uh, Peter had. Uh, he had a house in Lakeside, Michigan, just across the lake from Chicago. And some of his neighbors were uh, a group of astute Chicagoans and who were really concerned about what was happening to the Chicago Tribune under Sam Zell. And they decided they were going to try to do something about it. So they, uh, they, 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 they decided they wanted to try and form an online news organization. And Peter asked me, he said, you know, could you, uh, could you come and help? Would you help us? And I said, well, you know, Peter, uh, first of all, I got a book due. I owe you a book. And secondly, I really wasn't too, you know, energized about running another news organization. I'd kind of been there, done that. And, uh, you know, so I told him, I said, you know, Peter, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. Now, a couple of things that happened to me at Harvard really probably swayed my mind that maybe I should lend a hand. 
Uh, one of them was when I got to Harvard, I met a lot of people in the Neiman program, the Neiman Foundation program, and they're mid-career journalists. And they're heading off to Harvard, and this should be a milestone in their career. This should be really something that's a great experience. And they get to Harvard, and they turn around, and they're worried about when, when they go back after their fellowship's over, are they still going to have a job? Will they still be employed? They were, newspapers all around the country are laying off people like crazy. And so one of the women in, in, in the uh, program worked for the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And while she was in her fellowship, they closed the paper, and then they said they're going to go online, and they called her up and they offered her her job back. She was a columnist, not just some cub reporter. Columnist, they offered her a job back at half her salary. So she said no, and she now works for Al Jazeera. So thank you, Al Gore. Um, the, uh, another experience I had, and my students will hear this will be familiar to some of them, is I went to the Harvard Business School to listen to a presentation of a case study on troubled newspapers. And um, the, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I, I was sitting there and, and uh, one of these young men, and keep in mind, we're talking about the Harvard Business School. These are our brightest young business minds. And this one young man says during this presentation, you know, anybody can be a reporter today. And he gets up and he says, all you got to do is hold up your, uh, your iPhone and you kind of just take a picture of what's going on. You post it on the Internet and you're a reporter. And I thought, wow, is that all there is to it? I spent all this time doing all this other kind of reporting and I could have gotten away with that. So at the end, the professor asked me if I'd like to comment. And so I said, yes, I would. And I said to this young man, I said, you know, if in my career all I'd ever done was just tell people what I saw or tell what happened in front of me, I would have never written a story. Because that's not what journalism's about. You've got to dig. You have to go out. You plow through records. You verify sources. You verify information. You determine the credibility of things. That's what journalism is. It's not holding up a, an iPhone. And I walked out of there and I thought to myself, I felt... I felt you know, just stunned that, that someone of that level of education knew so little about journalism. But then I started thinking about it. I thought, you know, we haven't done a very good job as an industry of explaining what good journalism is and why it matters. So I called Peter back and I said, I'll tell you what, I, I, I think it's time for me to pay a little back. I, journalism was really good to me and I had a great career as a journalist. And a time, it was time to pay a little back. So I, t I said, I'll tell you what, Peter, you, you have a problem here. You have a news organization. You want to start a news organization, but there's three things missing. One, money. You have none. <laughs> Two, you really have no philosophy of what you're going to do. How are you going to, well, what are you going to cover? Now, yeah, it's a news organization in Chicago. Is it going to cover crime? Is it going to cover the city hall? What are you going to do? You need a, you need a theory and a philosophy. And then you have nobody, you have no staff. Nobody. It's just an idea. And I said, so here's what I'll do. I'll be a catalyst for you. And I'll come to work there after my fellowship is over. And I'll work for a year for no pay to help get this off the ground. And I'll find somebody to run it. But I repeat, I do not, do not, do not want to run another news organization. Famous last words. So, so uh, af after, the, uh, after we... we, we I got through with my fellowship. I headed to Chicago, and I ran a funny story. I, I, uh, one of the first things, I'm driving along down the interstate from Cambridge, and I get a call from uh, Peter Osnos. He says, you've got to be in Chicago Monday because uh, Newt Minow, who's a former FCC commissioner, has lined up an interview with you with the McCormick Foundation. And I said, Peter, are you kidding me? The McCormick Foundation? I said, do you know who heads the McCormick Foundation now? He said, no, who? It's David Hiller. He's a publisher that fired me six months ago. <laughs> he, you're gonna, and I'm going to go ask him for money? He said, well, yeah, I guess you're going to have to. Can't disappoint Newt. So I ended up going to Chicago, and I, there I was a, a few days later sitting in front of David Hiller, who we had just had, a, had a, this vicious fight over in L.A., uh, 
uh, making a proposal for them to give money to get the Chicago News Cooperative off the ground. What, what really started there was, was what I just mentioned, the Chicago News Cooperative. I got back to Chicago and, and, I had, and when I was in Cambridge, I was trying to figure out, well, what are these guys going to do? I mean, what are you going to do? And, and, I, I, and I, I went to bed one night trying to figure that out. And I, I'll never know why I came up with this, but I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, we should start a nonprofit news cooperative. And what we could do, and at the time, all the rage was the social networking that was really starting. I thought we could create these social networking sites organized around an interest in the news. So if you're interested in education and you're in Chicago, you could become part of this news interest network for education. We would provide really good, solid journalism. And it wouldn't take that many reporters to do this. And you could get information you couldn't get anywhere else. And we could do a news interest network for science. We could do one for, for art and culture. We could do one for politics. We could do a lot of these. And, and, and they would all be part of the co-op. Now at the time, uh, America Online and Yahoo had just uh, had been for, for years giving away content and so anybody that would even suggest remotely that you'd have to pay for news or pay for news content was looked at like they were crazy. And I said, well, we wouldn't ask people to pay for the news. What we would do is say, if you join the co-op, uh, you can have access to as many of these news interest networks for you all, that you want. And all we ask from you in return is a donation, a membership fee of $2 a week, which is less than the price of a cup of coffee in most Starbucks that you go into. And then I kind of figured, okay, if we could get 40, maybe 50,000 members over five years, that would give us four to five million dollars that we could plow back into journalism and use to hire young people who are coming out of college that aspire to be reporters. Now that's less than one half of one percent of the population of Chicago. And we would, to, to get the thing started, we would become a nonprofit, a philanthropy. We would rely on philanthropy and, and some donations to get us started, to give us the money to build these news interest networks so that we could generate this revenue and become self-sustaining over five years. That was really the basic idea of the Chicago News Cooperative. So uh, when I got back to Chicago, though, we didn't have any money, none. And, I, I, and the board wasn't raising any. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, you know, if, uh, I guess I gotta learn how to raise money. Because if I'm not gonna raise the money, nobody else is gonna do it. So I started on an education program, which I found incredibly as a journalist and distasteful, but nevertheless, it had to be done. And um, so then I got another call, one another fateful call. And this time it was from the New York Times. And an editor there said, we hear you're working on something, and we're kind of interested in what you're doing. Tell me a little bit about it. So I told him this idea of this, of this news cooperative. And he said, uh, well, you know, that's pretty intriguing. Would you come out here and, and tell our people about what you're planning? Because we're looking for a partner in Chicago to provide Chicago news for the pages of the New York Times. Now, why was the New York Times so interested in Chicago? Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch had bought the, uh, the Wall Street Journal and had gone into New York and created New York pages in the Wall Street Journal and was attacking the Times ad and reader base. And they were afraid that he was going to do the same thing in Chicago. So they wanted to get a partner out in Chicago and get up and running pretty quick and beat him to the punch. So, uh, we went back and forth and over a, a several couple of months, and uh, we still didn't have a lot of money. And I said to them, look, you know, I've got applications in, but we don't have the money. We can't possibly do this. And so they came back to me with this irresistibly tempting offer and said, I'll tell you what, we will make a financial and a journalistic contribution to help you get the co-op off the ground, but in return, you're going to have to get it up and running and producing copy for us by November. That's about, that was about six to eight weeks away. We had no staff or anything. So, but you know, journalists you get used to, can you, know, can you do the story tomorrow? Sure. You know, so I said, okay, yeah, we can do that. 
So then Peter Osnos, through his connections, got me an audience at the MacArthur Foundation, this huge, very wealthy foundation in Chicago. And uh, I went to them to make a presentation. Now I have to tell you, this was the most awful presentation I have ever made anywhere. It was terrible. I felt like, oh my God, they're going to throw me out of here. And at the end of it, uh, this pr terrible presentation, I said, all I really need from you is a million dollars. And they, uh, you know, kind of looked at me funny and they said, look, this is impossible. For, in the first place, uh, we could never get you that money on your timetable if you need it by November. Secondly, the only way we could do that is an expedited grant. And an expedited grant, you can't have more than $500,000. I said, okay, give me $500,000. So I laughed. And I said, boy, that was, a, that was a bomb. And to my utter astonishment, and a few weeks later, the MacArthur Foundation approved a $500,000 grant for the Chicago News Cooperative. It was the fastest turnaround on a grant application in the, in the foundation's history. So that gave me about a million dollars to get this going. I wanted to raise another two to three. I said, really, you need to have some cushion, otherwise you're going to be chasing money all the time. But my board and the New York Times wanted to get going right away. So uh, against my better judgment, uh, we started the, the New York Times, producing copy for the New York Times in uh, November of 2009. Here's what the pages kind of look like. They were just like those. And as you see at the top, it says it's produced by the, for the New York Times by the Chicago News Cooperative. This is the first time in the New York Times history that they ever turned over space pa uh, pages in their paper to be filled by an editor that wasn't employed by the New York Times. So it was a pretty big deal. And we got a lot of attention. A lot of people were, were, were talking about what a great thing this was. Uh, uh, I became suddenly... I became somewhat of a mini celebrity. I was like, a, I, I, had, I was no longer an old hack from the newspaper that didn't know what they were doing. Now I was an entrepreneur. And uh, so I, and frankly, I wasn't really reveling in, the, in, in all of that. But uh, we did, we got the CNC going. And I spent the next maybe close to three years working at the Chicago News Cooperative. Uh, we, had a, uh, uh, we had a lot of fun. We really did. Uh, the, 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 uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how you build a board that can raise money. I had to learn a little bit about raising money myself, which I said was, was not too, too much fun. I didn't like it, but I was doing it. Uh, we raised overall probably around two to three, probably a little over $3 million in the times that we, we, were, we were going. We produced uh, some really uh, good, good journalism, with it, which was a lot of fun. Uh, one of our, one of our was our political blog, under the same, under the old venerated uh, Chicago uh, uh, dictum of uh, vote rigging. Is uh, you know you vote early and you vote often, and so we created early and often, which was our political blog. We did get a a, a, a education site built. Um, we, <clears throat> we, we won several awards for, for uh, we won the first prize in the Edu American Education Writers Association Awards. We won an Annie Casey Award for our coverage of the underprivileged. We went into the, into the city and we started writing about abandoned housing. We started writing about gang problems. And we were writing about things that the, the, the major papers were no longer writing about. And, and, and what really made me, what was really kind of interesting and fun is we made those papers actually start paying attention to those subjects because we were making them look bad. And so uh, we went on for, for quite some time uh, producing pages for the New York Times. And that was, a no, that was a fun experience because, you know, the New York Times is a very demanding group of editors. And uh, I, we got along great, really. And they were very happy with our copy. And, and it was a great experience. But after about two, oh, maybe two and a half years, it became very clear to me that <clears throat> we were not going to be able to raise this kind of philanthropic money we thought we could. Um, you found tremendous resistance to paying for news. You found tremendous resistance of looking at a news organization as a charity, particularly when you had two newspapers in Chicago. 
I, I, I began looking at this and thinking, you know, it's, this, this probably isn't what we've got to change strategy. And about that time, I heard from a friend that the Chicago Sun-Times might be for sale. Uh, a group of investors who had bought it out of bankruptcy uh, was led by a fellow named James Tyree who ran Mesero Financial, a huge, big private equity company. And I, he had died suddenly and tragically. And I heard his investors wanted out. And I thought, well, you know, you could probably buy that paper pretty cheap. And, uh, and then you could, you could merge these two organizations. So I went to the bo my board and, uh, with a rather audacious proposal that we raise enough money to buy the Chicago Sun-Times. And by this time, my board was composed of some fairly wealthy Chicagoans I had, uh, I had attracted to, to come in. And, you know, at first they looked at me and said, I was, are you crazy? And I said, no, look, I said, this is a major market newspaper, and you can get it cheap. And we buy that, and we create something that nobody's done. We create a nonprofit, for profit hybrid. And we will create, we will use this, the, the Sun-Times assets to build a really vibrant online news organization that just happens to publish a newspaper instead of having a bunch of newspapers that just happen to have a website. Turn it on its head. Well, uh, they actually started getting, getting interested in this. So throughout 2012, uh, I worked with my board to recruit investors to buy the Sun-Times. And at the end of 2012, we did indeed buy the Chicago Sun-Times. They formed a new company called Rappaports that would own the Sun-Times. But we never really could make it work with the idea of the Chicago News Cooperative, Cooperative fitting in with, uh, with the, uh, the, the Sun-Times. And one reason, I think, is that some of the people who were on the board just weren't that interested in it. It was a nonprofit, and these were all capitalists, and nonprofit was a dirty word to them. Secondly, uh, it was just too much to swallow in the limited time we had. So uh, I cut a deal with them. I said, I'll tell you what, you hire uh, or offer my job or hire my people, and, uh, and then you pay me for the intellectual property rights of the Chicago News Cooperative. And uh, I'll get out of the way, and you guys can move on, and I can use that money to pay off all the debt, any debts we had. So that's what I did. Uh, and in uh, May of 2012, I filed papers uh, that, uh, this, uh, that basically ended the life of the CNC with no debt, uh, no outstanding debt. And uh, most of the, the reporters went over to the Sun. Some of them went to the Sun-Times. Most of them, all of them went to work somewhere else because they were all really good. And they were all, we had a nice mix of young people. And some of the, uh, this, was a, this was the CNC website when we, when, we, by, when we went down. And then you can see that some of this copy is back in the Sun-Times. There's early and often right there, the political blog of the Sun-Times. So a lot of what we were doing is alive and well in the Chicago Sun-Times. So uh, that's the peril of my talk. What about the promise? Um, <clears throat> well, you stop and think about what happened here. When I got into the newspaper business, you had to be a multimillionaire several times over to start a newspaper and to be in the news business. You had to buy plants, you had to buy trucks, you had to get pay reporters, you had to buy editors. And here, we had a group of journalists had no money, and we started a news organization in Chicago in a threadbare real estate office across the street from a, a, a bagel shop. And we lasted for two and a half years, producing news not only for our own website, but for the, the best paper in this country. And I think that was remarkable, and it represents the kinds of, of, of opportunities that are available for young journalists who want to come out and start something on their own. And this is incredible. You couldn't have done this in, in, for, for years, but now you can, because you can get in. If the, the, the cost of entry is so easy. And there are journalists going out, striking out on their own. Um, <clears throat> when I was at the LA Times, I asked myself a question. I said, what, you know, look at all the disruption and all of that that has occurred over history. Has anything survived all of that? You know, we went from, uh, from Gutenberg to radio to TV to the Internet 
to social networking sites, to Google, to all that. Has anything survived all of that activity? And I came up with one thing. It was good storytelling. A good story, a story well told, has survived all the disruption, and I predict it still will survive the disruption. Um, so the, what's happening now is you're seeing that uh, some of these, there are people striking out on their own and trying to create uh, uh, new ways of storytelling so that will have enough value that you can finance it and you can help pay for it. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in, uh, in that, uh, that, that, everything, you know, that, that everything that happens has probably happened before. You may think you have a brilliant idea, but probably somebody's thought of it before. And I think that's the, same, that's the way it is with the Internet. The, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it reminds me much, I think there are a lot of parallels with the penny press in the, in the 19th century. In the 1830s, journalists like Benjamin Day and James Gordon Bennett came along, and they took, papers were selling for six cents, and they lowered the price to one cent. And what happened? They spread the readership out. They actually, and when they were serving these new classes of readers, they redefined what news and content was about. And I think the same thing is happening with the Internet. The, they sp we've spread out. We've driven the cost down to nothing most, in most cases. We've had a, we have a much wider readership, and we are redefining the content. And in the, in the Penny Press case, what happened when, when people got tired of reading the kind of crime news and all of that that was new? They turned to magazines like uh, Sam McClure's magazine, McClure's, which published uh, a group of writers like Arta, Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Steffens, who, were known, who, who became known to be muckrakers. And if you look at them, they are people who had their own brand. If that sounds familiar to people, you should, because that's, what's, that's, what's, that's, what they, that's what they were. They were known by themselves. They weren't known for being a writer for McClure's. They were known as Lincoln Steffens and Ida Tarbell. So, what, so, so let's take a quick, real quick look at some of the things that are happening now. Now, this isn't exactly a new face. This app is a new kind of book. But this is fascinating. You can browse through the different chapters by swiping through the visual table of contents or browse through a chapter by scrolling through the pages at the bottom. To start reading, use two fingers to pop a page open. To go back to the table of contents, just pinch the page down. You'll find images, movies, and interactive infographics resting on the pages throughout the end. You can pick anything up using two fingers and pop it open. Tap the globe in the corner to see a photo's location on an interactive map. Pinch to return to the page you were reading. Movies work the same way. Most modern binge journals consist of large. Some images unfold to reveal the other half. Some photos have audio commentary. Industrial agriculture now uses ten counters. A hand icon marks our choices interactive infographic. Pop one open and use your finger to explore the data. I hope that you will enjoy this new reading experience and that it will help to inspire you to take action and to think in new and creative ways about how we can work together to solve the climate problem. Another thing that I'm involved in, uh, which is uh, uh, as a former Chicago Tribune colleague, probably one of the most interesting uh, journalistic ventures I've seen, and I'll show you a little bit about that here. Slow journalism, deep journalism. Paul Selleck's response to the self-perpetuating cycle of crisis reporting that defines the world's frenetic 24-hour news cycle. As a distinguished career foreign correspondent, 
Paul has covered conflicts and breaking news across the globe. But now he's forging a new journalistic path, slowing down and immersing himself in the people, places, sights, and sounds behind the headlines. He's walking around the world. Paul embarked on his epic journey in January 2013, retracing the first successful migration of ancient humans out of Africa some 60,000 years ago Paul began what will be a seven-year trek from the cradle of our species in the Horn of Africa through the Middle East, Asia, and finally to the tip of South America, the place where our forefathers exhausted their quest for new horizons. Paul calls this narrative project the Out of Eden Walk. By slowing down and covering the world at three miles an hour, I get to see connections that would be otherwise hidden to most journalists. By moving slowly through communities, by moving slowly across landscapes, I get to actually make the links between the major issues of our day that are otherwise covered in a pointillist fashion. Links between education and terrain, between environment and warfare. All of this becomes apparent when you connect the dots that are today's warrant of headlines. The walk brings deeper understanding, deeper meaning from a panorama of endless information. In his inaugural year, Paul walked up the Rift Valley of Ethiopia, traveled by camel boat across the Red Sea, and entered Saudi Arabia, the first Westerner since Lawrence of Arabia to trek through some stretches of this vast desert. Embedding himself in the lives of those he encounters, Paul will cover the great stories of our time, climate change, war, cultural survival, technological innovation, on foot in the centuries-old tradition of Greek bards and those early merchants and traders, neutral emissaries whom people entrusted with their stories. Through Paul's eyes, we see the coastal sawclaps of Nestura, dazzling white like lightning or diamonds. Through Paul's ears, we hear the bleeding of goats, the lashing of waves and the mournful voices of Syrian sailors on a livestock boat crossing the Red Sea. With Paul, we meet Ethiopian scientists and nomads in a famous boneyard where daily life continues amid fossil remains of ancient men. And with Paul, we taste the sweetness of an orange outside the mosque in Medina, where 60,000 people break the Ramadan fast beneath the sunset sky. By slowing to a walk, Paul invites people to see their own worlds in new ways, to experience the stories we miss when we move fast but see little. Students across the globe can connect directly with Paul through video chats, Twitter, and a free online interactive curriculum developed by Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Pulitzer Center of Crisis Reporting. The Out of Eden Walk connects schools across borders and allows students to connect their lives so now if you want to see more about this and see what he's writing, you can go to his website, the Out of Eden Walk website. It's outofedenwalk.com and see the kinds of journalism that he's producing on this walk that will continue for quite a while. I'm just going to show you one more, which I think is a really interesting thing too. And this is a, this is a venture put together by a programmer, a writer, and an editor to create a narrative nonfiction called Atavist.
So we are just beginning to explore these horizons of digital journalism. And it's just, it's really just starting. And a lot of journalists are beginning to break off on their own. They're leaving these calcified corporate cultures that resist change and that are risk adverse and they're striking out on their own. They have passion for their subject. They want to, they want to tell stories and they want to tell stories in a way that are meaningful to people and that are meaningful to young people and older people and whoever wants to pick up something and read and hear a good story. So if I, I often think of, of, and particularly with my students, they'll ask, people will ask me about the future of journalism. And, and I think the future of journalism it lies with the passion of the individual journalist. And, and, and as long as we have passionate journalists, we're going to be okay. And it'll, it's going to be, it's going to be, the story is going to have a far better ending than it looks now. Last week I had in my class, I teleconferenced in uh, two former Chicago Tribune colleagues. One was Kim Barker, who uh, is now with ProPublica, and the other was Bob Blau, who's now the executive editor of investigations at Bloomberg. And it did my heart and head and soul good to hear them speak with such passion about what they're doing. And to, hear my, to have my students hear this and hear how passionate they are about what they're doing. And I believe that as long as we have journalists with passion and as long as we have journalists that are really out there trying to tell the story, that the peril will always be overshadowed by the promise. Thank you very much. So if anybody's got questions, I'd be glad to take them. Yes? Um, the, the out of Eden Walk is a 501c3. It gets some money from National Geographic. It gets some money from the Knight Foundation. It gets some money from the uh, uh, Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And uh, you know, I'm I'm on the board. We're trying to figure out how to continue that. So uh, we're trying to raise that. The uh, Atavist is private. Uh, it's funded by. Uh, one of the investors is Eric Schmidt from Google. Uh, they're, they're, they're invest there's a lot of Silicon Valley people that are interested in that. And uh, so, so that's, a, that's a different weather. That's a privately funded thing. They, and they get money. They, they sell either individual articles or you can buy a subscription. And the pieces they do, they're serious nonfiction journalism. Uh, and, and, you know, they have at the top how long it should take you to read it. So it'll say, here's this thing, it'll take you 42 minutes. And it's, 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 it's longer than a magazine, typical magazine article, but it's, it's, uh, it's shorter than, than the others. And then let's see, I showed you that, I showed you the Out of Eden Walk. I'm trying to think of what the first. Oh, the Al Gore, the Al Gore's fine. <laughs> When you sell out to Al Jazeera, you know, I mean, when you, you, you got a little money. So that's his book, basically, and he's, he's pub, uh, probably funding that with a publisher. So, so what's the, I guess, the, the long-term viability for, for those or things like that? I mean, are they, are they sustained? I mean, you mentioned the one, the 501c3 that was relying on grants, and I don't know, is that? I think we're, we're in the process right now of figuring some of this out. Um, I don't think, my personal view is if it's, a, if it's charitable, that it's got a limited life, unless you create a, a sustainable source of revenue. Because foundations, at least in my experience, is they'll give you money and they'll get you going, but they want you to find somebody else to pick it up. They don't want to give you money for the rest of their lives. So you have to create a, a revenue source to do that. And it isn't going to be advertising. Advertising could be part of it. But advertising is not going to be what it was to journalism because advertisers don't need the audiences that journalists provide anymore. So you have to figure a way to get paid for some of this. I think you need to create a diversified stream of revenue that relies on advertising, that relies on some subscription. And maybe you're in a different business that, that has nothing to do with journalism but supports it. Like I think this uh, Pierre Omidor who is uh, from, from uh, uh, 
eBay, the found, one of the eBay founders that's, that's just donated $250 million to this thing that Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and all these guys are starting. And I think he's looking at, can you build a technology company? And the technology company will support, also support some journalism. So I think there's a lot of experimentation going on right now. And I, I don't know that anybody's got the answer. But the fact is, this is the first time since I've been watching this stuff when I've seen so many individual journalists walking out of jobs like at the Washington Post and Urza Klein walked out of there and went to Vox. And all of these smaller kinds of organizations that are more nimble, that where you can take chances, where you can explore. Uh, and you can, you can look at these, these are powerful ways to tell a story, very powerful. And if you can get these people, if you can get this in an economic way, and you can figure out how people can access it without a lot of trouble, not giving your credit card out every time and that, I, I think you will, you will get somewhere with it. But it's going to take a little time. It isn't going to happen overnight. But there's a, I mean, I, I'm very encouraged by the experimentation that's going on. And I, I think, you know, you aren't going to see a lot of this from, from your legacy media companies, except for maybe the New York Times, who's doing a lot of interesting work. But most of the legacy media companies are just hanging on by their, they're, they're just doing everything they can to survive. And they're very risk adverse. So I don't think you're going to see much from them. Yeah. Um, Jim, one of the stories you tell in your book, The Deal from Hell, is how you were trained as a journalist. Yeah. And the sort of path you took, uh, training at a small Midwestern newspaper, moving from paper to paper, kind of working your way up, uh, this feeding chain, Yeah. Well, there's still, you know, there are a lot of websites out there that are that are training young journalists that that need they need they need the low cost labor. Frankly, you can learn a lot there. You can learn how to do things. You can learn how to use the technology there much easier than you can. And and, and a lot of uh, newspapers are still hiring younger people and they train them on how to cover police and do those sorts of things. The path is not as clear as it used to be. I mean, I look at it and I say, okay, I knew where I had to go. I had to go to a small paper and I had to work my way up the food chain. Uh, uh, young people today, they, th that path isn't so clear. They can go to websites, they can go to uh, uh, you know, politicos and all these other so sorts of organizations and learn the ropes. Uh, but they have this opportunity that I never had, and that is they, within a few years they can start their own thing and start doing their own thing and learning by, by associating themselves with, with, with some of these other people, the so-called brands. So I hate the word brand. I hate the thought of journalists becoming a star, but it's happening, and it's happened before. Yeah, Tony. I think what they're asking is about the culture of the newsroom. Right? I mean, that's, that's how I learned journalism. I was in the newsroom. Yeah. Oh, I know it. People are at their computers at home or with their laptops or whatever. So how are you going to get that culture to get the values of professional journalism? Well, that's hard to do. My daughter, I mean, my, you're, you're talking about my daughter. She works for one of the Sun-Times newspapers, and she worked at the CNC, so she got a lot of it there. But uh, she, she, never, she, doesn't, she doesn't go in a newsroom. She, she goes in one, once or twice a week. And so it's harder to get that you know, that kind of uh, 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 training and that kind of, and really it's the social interaction that you get. So I always tell them, I hate to say this, but I always tell them, go out in a bar and sit around and have a few beers with these old geezers and have them tell you war stories and you'll get some good, you'll get some good information. And it's true. Yeah. So I have one of these sort of new journalism projects in Detroit. Part of the way the sustainability 
record citizens in Detroit talking about their experiences with arts and culture there. So Ford will say, oh, come to the auto show and get people talking about, I'll hire you to do that. But ethically, it feels so fuzzy if you're a traditional journalist. That, and I know I have to get over that. Do you think we have to forgive ourselves? But then it feels really wrong to me. Well, I don't know. I have two thoughts on that. One is it, it's a bad way to go uh, for, for this mixing of the thing. But then I look at it and I say, well, journalists should get in charge of that and make sure it's done right because it can be done right. I mean, we had advertorials all the time in newspapers. We had advertisers that we had to deal with. And, and we, di we did it right. And we, we established the kind of rules of the road so that you wouldn't have the, the abuses that could easily occur. I mean, you're seeing that now with a lot of this so-called sponsored content and, and where you know, the uh, journalist writes stories for the advertiser and not for the general public. And then they, they put a little tiny thing up their advertisement and you can't even read it. So, I mean, I think that's a dangerous trend. But if, and, and when I was at the CNC, they, they brought that up. And I said, well, you know, w we could try it, but we're going to make sure it's done right. If, if you're going to do it with, with us, it's going to have, it's got to be journalistically solid or we won't do it. And I think that's, you, you can't just say, oh, we're, we're not going to do it anymore. We're not going to do anything like that because they're going to do it. So you've got to figure out how you can make them do it and do it right. Yes, it is. So news has always been a commodity. Um, and there have been different eras when people, particularly the commercial classes, have been willing to pay more for it. Um, and then advertising really came in and began to sort of support the bulk of journalism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. <coughs> and so that really undermined people's understanding that they were still paying, yeah. right? Right. Um, and you, you talked about the resistance to paying for content. And just wondering if you could say a little bit more of that. I mean, I'm, you know, so I've got the HuffPost app on my phone. And now, when I go to HuffPost, if I'm waiting for a plane or something, you know, I get some ad on the bottom advertising single men, you know, to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And it's really annoying, and mm -hmm. I'd rather pay. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pay and not have the single man to add. And so I'm wondering, like, what more your you and folks in the industry are seeing, seeing, feeling about maybe some people would be willing to pay something to not have these stupid pop-up ads and all that kind of stuff. Well, I think you will see over time people the resistance to paying will come down. But it's hard. I mean, I was just talking to my students the other day. WBEZ is a terrific public radio station in Chicago. It's been going on forever. It, and, uh, and, and, you know, and they rely on many sources of revenue, but a lot of it is individual donors. So you have this population of seven, eight million people in Chicago. How many do you think donate money or members of WBEZ? Take a guess. Anybody take a guess? Huh? 200,000. 65,000 people. So that's less than, you know, that's not even 1% of the population. There's tremendous resistance. You do have people that will pay. I pay for the New York Times. I pay a lot. I actually have two subscriptions, one in Chicago and one in Ann Arbor. They, they really got me coming and going. But, you know, you look at Bloomberg. Bloomberg, you pay uh, $20,000 to have a Bloomberg machine in your office. And, uh, and it's got, I'm telling you, fantastic journalism. They do some of the best journalism. And a lot of people don't see it because you, you got to have one of these machines to see it. So, you know, one of the things I think is dangerous is that you're, you're sliding towards a, a system where you will have really good journalism for people that are rich and not much for people who are poor because nobody wants to deal with it. You'll end up with something like you got here in Ann Arbor, you know, for the, for the masses of people, which is a joke. Here. So I think, you know, I think over time people will get used to it. You have to come up, what you have to do, one of the things that I'm, I was, that I'm involved in in Chicago is a way, uh, how can you devise a way so that if someone's reading a story and, and they want to read more and they, and they wouldn't mind paying for it, and I'm, we're, we're not talking about a dollar, we're talking about a dime or a nickel or even 15 cents or something. How can you devise a, the software so that they could access that story easily and pay for it easily 
without going through a lot of rigmarole. And, and I think that's where you got to you got to get over that hump before you can get people to pay. I don't think people are that. You know, it's an interesting thing. When we, we started a, a, a paper in Chicago called Red Eye, and it was supposed to be for young people. And we started it off, and it was going to be paid. And we were going to charge a quarter for it. And uh, we got going. And all the kids, a lot of the kids actually liked having the physical paper because they could put it in their backpacks, and then they could pull it out, and they could find out where stuff was going on and things like that. But the one thing they didn't like that we found tremendous resistance to paying for it. And why? Was it, it wasn't because they, it was a quarter. It wasn't that they, they had to stop somewhere, get in their pocket, get a quarter out, give you the quarter, and then you give them the paper. So we finally had to just take it free because we couldn't, we couldn't, get, the, we couldn't get the readership without that. So, so it's, the, it's the mechanism by which you can extract the money from the thing is the problem. It's not really that resistance to payment. And I, and I think it's also the same I always hear that young people don't like to read. I don't think that's true. I think a lot of them do like to read. It's just you got to give it to them in a format that they want and that they enjoy and that they find easy to get to. Although my students really like reading all these newspaper articles like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no other questions, please join me in thanking Jim.